record button. Thank you. So, um, yeah, we'll go ahead and get started because Dr. Morris has some uh, time constraints this evening. He has another meeting after this. So we're, we're very grateful to Dr. Morris, who is the um, medical director at uh, DAP Health, uh, for joining us this evening. And he is the primary investigator for the ANCHOR study, an anal cancer prevention study funded by the National Cancer Institute at the NIH um, that they have been the uh, Palm Springs location for for the past several years. And um, so you've heard us talk about this over the years. I won't steal his thunder, but uh, we'd like to welcome Dr. Morris. And uh, I'll go ahead and pull up your um, slides and then we'll take it from there. And then um, I think unless you have really important clarifying questions during his talk, if you have questions, if you could use the uh, chat fun function to put them in there. And then um, we can, if, if possible, we can hold most of the questions till the end and have a, uh, a discussion and Q&A at that time, if that works for everybody. So let me start sharing. Make sure all the tech works. And can everybody see those slides? And yep. And we will start from the beginning. Yes, sir. Terrific. That's it. Dr. Morris, take it away. Okay, uh, Jeff, thank you for the invitation. We had the conversation a couple months ago, and I'm appreciative to be able to address this group. And especially uh, hello to a couple people that I know on here. Uh, Gary Horns, one, um, uh, Mark George, and of course, Jeff. So thank you for inviting me. So this presentation is on the Anchor update. And uh, for those of you that don't know, it's an anal cancer research group. Uh, the, the acronym ANCHOR comes from Anor, Anal Cancer HCIL Outcomes Research. And HCIL is a, pathological, a pathology term for uh, anal cancer for predisposing uh, cells and trying to prevent anal cancer. So that's the gist of it. And the, the program's been around for about seven plus years. And DAP's been involved for close to four years. Okay, Jeff, so next slide. In the deck. So there's a team of us here at DAP working on this. Um, I'm the PI principal investigator and chief medical officer at DAP. Uh, Dr. Singh is sub investigator. She's our director of research at DAP. Uh, we have two outstanding HRA anoscopists, Will Hernandez and Anthony Velasco. Uh, and then our other research team is Michael McIntosh. Karina's new, she just got added in over the last two months. And Greg Jackson is really the person that's on the ground, really coordinating specifically the anchor study. So I'm very happy with this team and they've done, they've been doing a great job. Okay, Jeff. So for people to have entered the anchor study, the, the criteria for entering are that they're uh, people that live with HIV that are at least 35 years old and that have this high-grade anal dysplasia, the HCIL, and you'll hear a lot about that, high-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion. And as Jeff and I talked about, this is really a pap smear description, basically an anal pap smear description of cells that proliferate. And it's a way at looking at progression before you get to anal cancer. Um, and in our study, in the national study for seven years, there were two randomized arms. One was a treatment group that when we found the HCL, that we use hyfurcation or electric artery or topical treatments to stop the progression. And then the monitoring arm, people with an HRA every six months. And the idea is to say, will this monitoring help prevent and will the treatments help prevent progression to anal cancer? And that's the bottom line question for the anchor study. Okay, Jeff. Um, this is showing the 15 cities in the United States that are involved in the anchor study. Even though it's 15 cities, there are 21 current sites. Uh, DAP was one of the next to the last uh, that was added on about four years ago. So we're very lucky to be part of the study. Uh, this is an NIH-driven uh, study. 
and I was talking with Jeff earlier about how it got started and who the original funders were. And it's just been a very excellent study so far. Okay, Jeff. Um, the guru of the anchor study is Dr. Polefsky. I know he's spoken to this group at least two or three times. Uh, he's at UCSF and he's the, the core of the driving ambition to really answer this question to the NIH. Um, and he's devoted his career really to anal cancer prevention since 1991. Uh, he's in San Francisco and he started the anal neoplasia clinic research and education center at UCSF. Um, and then this was activated by the National Cancer Institutes in April of 2015. So he's my go-to person. He's the one that checks in with DAP often. He's usually down here about twice a year, and he, he's helping to oversee the programs throughout the United States. So the study design uh, was to screen over 17,000 volunteers across the United States to enroll about 5,000 patients to watch, follow, monitor uh, for five years. And then it was estimated, the question would be, can we get under 50 people who will develop cancer if you have these early ER interventions and can you really find them? So if you look at the complicated pathway on the left, you start with the screening criteria and say, do you find dysplasia? Do you find this HCIL? So if you don't find it, uh, they're not, patients aren't enrolled. If you do find it, they're randomized to two different trial arms. So one is to monitor, and it's basically looking at every six months to do an exam, to do the anoscopy with the scope, to do a biopsy if needed, to do swabs, and to check blood samples. And so that's the watch and see arm. And the intervention arm is to continue to do the every six months monitoring, do the rectal exam, do the anoscopy, do the biopsy if needed, do an anal swab as needed, take blood samples. And then the last step is different. And that is that this dysplasia, this HCIL is removed, either chemically, chemically or mechanically or through burning it. And then if cancer is found, when the cancer is found, the patients exit the study for further evaluation and treatment. Uh, some patients go on to have surgery if the cancers are uh, large enough, uh, but they all end up getting specialists if the cancer is found. So the idea is to screen and look and see if anybody's got early signs of dysplasia so they don't get to that area where the cancer develops. Okay, Jeff. So at DAP, we've screened over 220 patients for anchor. Uh, we first started screening in 2019. Our last screen was September of this year. Uh, and we've actually randomized 91 participants. We currently have 43 in the treatment uh, arm and about 48 in the monitoring arm. So that's where we are with our little piece in Palm Springs and as compared to a lot more patients throughout the nation. Okay, Jeff, thank you. So this is considered actually a really groundbreaking clinical trial. I talked to Dr. Palewski last week um, and he said so far with the over 4,000 participants that this treating and monitoring for these precursors for anal, uh, for for anal lesions significantly reduces the risk of progression to anal cancer on the treatment arm among people with HIV. So that is the, the study that's been going, home, been going on. And it turns out these treatments and monitor have been very successful uh, and that the anchor study has been the first to show any such of these findings. Um, there's a lot more exciting news, but the, 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 the research trial right now has shown some really great results, but we're, they're not ready to announce all the, all the things or to put them in the journals and so on and so on uh, because we're, we're continuing to work with the program. Okay, Jeff. 
Um, so this talks about the incident of anal cancer it is very high in people with HIV, and it's very similar to surveying and monitor and treating cervical cancer in women. In fact, that's the model that this was based on um, uh, because of the strong association with both anal cancer and with cervical cancer in women with HPV virus, which we know predisposes to dysplasia, which precedes these dysplastic cells in HSO. Um, and if you look at the complicated graph on the left, you'll see that if you look at anal cancer in a, or, or the HIV positive men with men, see, men having sex with men, look at the rates and it's, it's greater than that of breast cancer or prostate cancer in the general population. Um, and one of the statistics I remember is some 80% of people with HIV, men or women uh, that are HIV positive, will end up having the HPV virus. And the question is, will that HPV virus then lead to dysplasia? And then how long will that take if that were to turn into anal cancer? So the, the importance of this is that there's a very high risk of anal cancer uh, incidence in, in populations that we're studying. Um, okay, uh, this is going back to basic anatomy, you know, where the rectum hits the pelvic floor and then the anal canal below that. And there's the sphincter that opens and closes the, uh, the anus. And so it says that H cell, this dysplasia, these abnormal cells, can form in the anus, they can form in the cervix, in women in the vulva, vagina. They can actually, uh, you can have H cell in the esophagus. In fact, I have a patient currently who has a tumor in his oropharynx that has been diagnosed with H cell, and it's going to have to be removed. And if you recall, the GI tract starts at the mouth, ends in the anus, and so it makes sense that it could be elsewhere. So these H-cell lesions, again, that's really a pap smear, anal cervical pap smear um, term. Um, and H-cell is considered precancerous. And we think that you have mutations of the HPV from having these chronic infections. Okay, Jeff. Um, and again, this is a pathology slide. This is something you'd see in histology or pathology and, and medical school. And if you go to the left, you look at the cells from the outside going deeply. They all look very healthy, squamous on the outside. They're sort of flat, and then they plump up. And they, they're very different sizes. And if you go across the screen from left to right, the condyloma and then the grade one, mild dysplasia. But you can see that the cell types are becoming plumper and bigger and very different. And by the time you get to the grade two, moderate dysplasia, then moving to severe, then that goes to cancer. And at the very bottom, you see microinvasion where the, where the anal cancer would happen. So what you're trying to do is monitor to see normal that progresses to mild, get it at mild, get it at moderate, treat it before it gets to severe, before it turns into cancer. And that's why all th this could be the exact same pathology slide for cervical cancer in women. And in fact, when I was in med school, this is what we showed for, for women for getting cervical cancer. But it's HPV, it's dysplasia, it's what's being monitored, and it's what's part of a big important pathology part of the study. Okay, Jeff. So the treatment for this dysplasia or the eight cell. 90% of patients on anchor were treated using a technique called hyfrication or electrocartery. Uh, and hyfrication is really sort of mechanically uh, removing it. The electrocartery has smoke to it, and you're basically burning or laser treating this area of the dysplasia. So Anthony Valesco and Will Hernandez both are certified to monitor and to treat using this hyfrication that's the primary uh, treatment at DAP. 
it's done in a treatment room. It turns out DAP has two HRA anoscopy suites, um, and these have all been approved by Pilevsky and the higher-ups in, in the National Anchor Study. We have an intake room, and then we have the treatment room, uh, basically that's a sterile environment uh, and so on. And so we have two of these suites here. Uh, the procedure usually uses a surgical technique with an electric current to remove the areas of h cell, uh, the dysplasia. Okay, Jeff. Um, so the, the, the treatment here is if you go across, there's a measurement. The treatment of h cell was developed initially with cervix and female, but the, you have a measurement device, you have an anoscope, um, which is clear and you can see around in every direction. And then that's inserted into the anal canal so that you can look around. And then there's a camera device that actually takes pictures up in there. And then that's the hyfurcation tool that could go in and treat the areas of dysplasia. So that's just a very kind of crude and elementary um, look at to what that is. Okay, Jeff. Um, actually, that's the that's the end of this. Uh, that's the end of the slides, and I really tried to walk you through. Uh, currently, there's been a pause or a halt on the study because we're having such great success with the treatment arm that um, the protocols are now being developed that anybody that finds the dysplasia now uh, everybody's going to end up being treated. Uh, the study is certainly not over. It'll be probably at least another two more years plus before the study's over, uh, even though there will be a change up. And we're waiting for those protocols. They're not all currently finalized. So there's some flux of this going on. But at the end of the day, it's really, really, really good news because these therapies have been found to be very highly successful in helping us out and to really get to the bottom of the question about does monitoring and does treatment prevent anal cancer? And, and, and that's what the anchor study is about. So I see some chat uh, going on here. I'll take a look here. Um, let's see. It said, uh, so David Jarvis says, the incidence of anal cancer slide is information is wonderful. I had no idea that the rate being so much even greater than uh, breast cancer and prostate cancer. Um, another person said, I had uh, hyfurcation done at DAP. I'm one of the successes, so we're, we're always happy for that. Um, and, and I'm at this point certainly open and willing to answer any questions. Um, but that's just the brief overview of Anchor Study, kind of the good news of where we are. Uh, it'll be going on for another two years. I think that our enrollment um, has closed off because we can't take any new patients into it. Uh, but we will try to finish and retain and keep everybody that's currently in it and follow for another two years uh, regardless. Can I say something? Absolutely. This is, this is David Jervis speaking. Hey, David. Um, I'm a patient of Anthony Velasco's yes. at, uh, for the last four years, and he's been treating me. Okay. And, and the last time that I was in, uh, the swab and his, uh, I can't remember the name of the process, but the actual visual uh, look. Yeah. Yes, uh, HRA. Yeah. The HRA. Uh, showed nothing to treat. And so after not only four years at DAP, but several years before DAP, I was seeing, um, I was having to have it checked every, I think it was every three to six months yeah. at first. And then, so now he says, I don't have to be checked for a year because it's all been pretty much uh, under control. So kudos to all of you for that. I think I, I don't know if I was actually part of the study and I don't know, it may have been explained to me at some point at some time and I may have signed something somewhere along the line. Yes. Uh, but I, and I don't remember, I do know that at one time, I think somebody from UCSF did come down and did monitor the procedure. And, yes. um, 
and I am so grateful. Well, uh, uh, thank you for kind of for your testimonial about that. Um, and, and, and here's the thing, even people that aren't in our anchor program, we're still doing HRAs, even if they're not enrolled in it, we're still doing the monitor and we're still doing the treatment. Um, and it just happens to be this very special program that we're very happy to work with Polevsky and the NIH on. So David, thank you for sharing that uh, particular information with us. Sure. Thank you. I see uh, Timothy Omasi, you have your hand up. Go ahead and unmute and... Uh... Thank you, Jeff. Um, and thank you, Dr. Morris. Um, I was your patient when you um, referred me over to Matt Moran and, um, and he found some stuff. I, another one of your patients, a mutual friend, had the horror story, had to have chemo and radiation. And that hearing yeah. that story from a mutual friend got me into Mr. Dr. Morris. Yeah, <laughs> good. <laughs> and um, I have three questions, but I want to kind of finish Matt Moran and then now Velasco. Velasco too told me last visit six months, three months ago that uh, everything's cleared. Uh, you only have to come once a year. And I chose with Dr. or with Matt Moran, he gave me the option, anchor study. And I said, or, <laughs> he goes, or you can be more um, aggressive. And that's what I chose for me. I, sure. I have done studies plenty in the past and I said, no, let's take care of it. <laughs> and, yep. um, and that was kind of aggressive for two or three years ago. And I'm so glad I did. Um, my two questions are, one, when, when he gives you that blessing, like, I don't see anything. It's been two visits now. You can go on every year. Are you guys seeing that once you're cleared, been gone through for a couple of years and they've hit every spot that that's it? Or is there still a, a possibility of it returning? So to answer that one question, you know, the standard of care really is if you get multiple times where it's all clear, then you get a pass for one year. And that's just the standard of care. Now for the anchor study, if you're involved in that, the, they're every six months because that's what the protocol says. Uh, but I think the one year is probably the mark if you're all clear, all margins, and they're doing that. So again, that's a great success story. Congratulations to you. And my second theme is, um, oh, I can hear well, good now. I, I've been um, really proactive through my whole HIV life. When I was up at UC Sac uh, Davis, um, I made a bet with my doctor that if I you know, I, I basically got the first Gardasil against his wishes, but I got it. And that was about 10 years ago. And then I pushed this last year to get the second more expanded Gardasil just as a preventative or as Matt Moran put it, therapeutic. Um, what is your take on that? So uh, part of the issue in the past has been that it was not approved or paid for for anybody that was over 18 years old. And now that's been expanded up to, I think, the 50s or something like that. So we are routinely giving the Gardasil now. Um, and, and it really helps that insurance pays for that because it's a series of injections. It's expensive. It runs about five to $800 if you paid out of pocket for it. Um, so it's, it's pretty much being offered these days. And we, we're recommending people get that. Even the ones that have gone through already a, a diagnosis? Um, not necessarily, because the idea of the Gardasil is prevention. Right. So if you already have it, we're not sure that it would make any difference that way. Um, so I just say individually discuss that with your individual clinician. So it's a great question. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you again. You're a lifesaver. Oh, I, 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 I'll do anything pretty much with Jeff. He's a, he's a mensch and great, and this is a great group. Yeah, it's actually lifesaver. <laughs> I know. <laughs> That's great. So just to piggyback, you said you do offer it to older patients. Does that include patients in their 50s and 60s and older, or just up to the um, ACIP guidelines? Of, uh, yeah, it's up, to the, it's up to the guidelines. And beyond that, if the patients want it and they want to pay out of pocket and we can't get it covered, then we'll we'll offer it. We'll do it that way. Okay, thank you, uh, Jim. I see you. Your hand up. Go ahead and unmute. I uh, I started in the uh, 
at UCLA with Dr. Mo. And uh, then I, I continued uh, when DAP uh, uh, opened up. And, uh, but from both UCLA and, uh, and uh, DAP, I got letters saying that, uh, well, just what you reported that, that things were a success. And uh, I, it seemed to me that it was uh, ceasing, but you said pausing. And I'm yeah. wondering, I'm wondering, and then I get texts every once in a while, um, you know, making sure I'm still alive, I guess. Um, <laughs> Those are nice. <laughs> I do have this sense of humor. And, and, uh, but I, you know, and I, but no one says anything about when to come in. Uh, and so I'm wondering if the pause is going to be um, lifted. Yeah, the pause will be lifted. We are anticipating January, February, because the the consensus has to be made from the top down and it's just not there. So everything's being done within what's safe for patients, but you'll, you'll be hearing January and February. Well, thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. And this is Jeff, just to piggyback on that. I was on the protocol team and I was a community advisor to the uh, AIDS Malignancy Consortium that developed this. So I kind of saw it happen from when it was just a gleam in Dr. Palefki's eye and, you know, the years of bureaucratic finagling to get the $89 million just to get the study off the road, off the ground. And so one reason they want to continue this is this is really once in a lifetime opportunity to look at the course of HPV disease in HIV positive people. So once they kind of figure out, okay, how often are we gonna see people and they switch everybody over to the treatment arms, now they've proven that's better than uh, the monitoring arm or the watchful waiting, they sometimes called it. Um, they wanna be able to continue that science because there's never gonna be another opportunity to set, you know, this is almost 5,000 people um, who are being studied for at least uh, five years, some up to eight, because that's when the study originally started. So. Um, yeah, it's, we're going to learn a lot about how HPV works and um, you know how effective these treatments are over time. So that's yeah, the reason they want to keep following people. Yeah, and, and Jeff, the other thing is the plan is to keep it at least two more years to follow people all the way through. So it does it doesn't end; it just ends with the new recruits. Yeah. Other questions for Dr. Morris? Hey, Bob. Hi, uh, thanks for your presentation. Thanks for the study. Uh, mm -hmm. And thanks in part to, to Jeff for uh, helping me connect with DAP and enrolling for evaluation. I had also been involved with Dr. Wiley at UCLA in Los Angeles for uh, uh, anoscopies and, and uh, similar screenings, but never enrolled in Anchor. Uh, I went through the full evaluation here and thankfully, I, uh, I came up with a clean bill, but just the peace of mind and the, uh, the comfort of knowing that uh, things are okay there in the netherworld and, uh, uh, you know, insights that an act, uh, a normal uh, standard proctologist uh, would not uh, be looking for or find. And uh, it was just all extremely well handled, extremely... Uh, uh, efficient. Um, your coordinator here in Palm Springs is great. And I just want to thank you for the work. And it's just really nice to know that uh, had something come up that I would be in good hand. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions or comments? If not, uh, thank you again, Dr. Morris. We really appreciate uh, taking time out of your busy schedule. I know you had a lot going on this evening and you're not done yeah. yet. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much. You are so you're, welcome. And thank you for your direction at DAP. It's been, you know, life-saving. Well, I thank you for that in particular. I had a really hard day today. So this event has actually made my day in a better part of my day. So thank you all for that. Sure. Absolutely. Thank, thank you again, you. and keep up the good work. We, bye -bye. we appreciate you, Dr. Morris. Okay, sure. thank you. So we have uh, some announcements. Um, Susana Concha Garcia from UCSD is going to tell us about a few studies, and then I'll let people know about uh, the future of positive life and uh, what we're going to be doing starting in um, January.
with uh, resuming in-person meetings. So uh, Susanna, go ahead and uh, take it away. Okay, uh, may I share the screen? Please. All right. Uh, Should be enabled. Yep. Okay. So the screen is gonna cover my whole desktop. Um, I encourage you to um, ask questions as we go along because I'm not gonna be able to see the chat. So yeah, I'll monitor just... that for you. So if anybody okay, can raise you. your hand, uh, if you have questions or put it in the chat and I'll help uh, monitor that. Alrighty. Um, my name is Susana Concha Garcia and I'm one of the research analysts at, the, at UCSD at the HIV Neurobehavioral Research Program. And I'm going to quickly go over some uh, studies that we have here at UCSD and also talk a little bit of, about our, our other research center. Um, we actually have um, studies, not only that are HIV related, having to do with the brain, we're all about the brain and some of the condition, but also the Cannabis Medicinal Research Center, which has a lot of folks who are HIV positive and HIV negative in the studies. Um, so I'm going to give you a brief overview and then if uh, please uh, ask your questions um, as I come up. Um, we are in Hillcrest in the city of San Diego and uh, we're primarily interested in HIV and aging, HIV and memory, we're also interested in co-occurring conditions like uh, tobacco use, uh, hepatitis, um, neuropathy, exercise, um, memory issues. And also we're, we have folks uh, who, um, when interested in organ donation for research purposes, they may uh, donate their brain to science. And uh, many of our studies are for folks who are 18 years and older and they can be HIV positive or negative. And uh, we are very sensitive to um, all gender expressions, ethnicities, and folks of different backgrounds. And all of our studies do not cost anything for our participants. As a matter of fact, we compensate you for your time and your effort. And for those who are far away, um, uh, we also include um, compensation for mileage. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, we are actually have multiple research centers uh, under the umbrella of the HIV Neurobehavioral Research Program. And these are just a few that have been around. The center has been around for um, 30 plus years. Uh, I know the California Neural Tissue Aid Study has been around for um, probably 28 of those uh, 30 years. And the Translational Methamphetamine AIDS Research Center, um, Charter has to do with the CNS, which is the Central Nervous System HIV Antiviral uh, Therapy Effects Research. And uh, so we've been doing research for a very long time. Um, so if you uh, want to participate in the study, what's involved? Well, we want you to know that we do confidential interviews over the phone. Um, prior to COVID, these were done in person, but right now we're doing them by phone or by video. And there is um, paperwork involved. We ask you about per your personal information, about your medical history, about your uh, employment and educational history. Um, we ask you about your um, HIV history, if you're HIV positive. And then uh, the studies um, include um, assessments and these can be medical or cognitive assessments. And that's uh, a general physical. Uh, we look at your reflexes. Uh, we do blood draws, saliva collection, stool collection, urine collection, and uh, spinal fluid collection uh, in some studies. And the cognitive assessments is really another way of uh, looking at a person's thinking skills and how it's affected by HIV or some other condition. And so we uh, try to measure your, your memory, your concentration, your reasoning, your alertness and quickness. And some of these uh, assessments include paper and pencil or a computer or with other types of um, props that we um, have you work with. There's also um, other components like some studies have uh, MRIs or have PET scans or uh, optional lumbar punctures. So we collect spinal fluid. 
And also uh, some of the studies may involve uh, equipment such as cell phones, a Fitbit, virtual reality glasses, the driving simulator or apps on your cell phone. And uh, some studies involve uh, study medication that could be Tessamorla nigrifta or it could be cannabis, either yours or ours. And uh, in some studies, um, uh, there is also uh, food where we, um, folks are randomized it into a particular study where they might receive olive oil, walnuts, or a Mediterranean diet. So they're, they're very interesting studies. They're about a variety of topics. And um, so uh, I'm gonna talk about some of the current studies right now. Uh, a study that's um, very popular and we need uh, plenty of folks right now is the uh, neuropathic pain and cannabis use study. So we're looking for folks who have a neuropathic pain and that they use cannabis to treat that pain. It could be CBD oil, it could be CBD with or without um, THC, which is the active ingredient in cannabis. It could be smoking cannabis or vaping cannabis. Uh, just as long as they um, think they have uh, neuropathy, we can do an evaluation to see if they do have neuropathy with pain. And um, so the details here uh, indicate that um, you can be, um, we're looking for folks who are um, HIV positive and um, we have uh, an initial uh, screening um, eligibility visit of one hour. And then there's an in-person medical screen of six to eight hours. And again, this in-person medical screen, um, because of COVID, we're doing part of that remotely and part of that um, in person. Obviously the parts that need to be done in person are usually the lab draw, the, um, uh, if, if a study has a lumbar puncture, that would have to be in person. Um, if we were to uh, uh, dispense uh, medication like a, a grifta or cannabis, that would have to be in person. So compensation for this uh, neuropathic study is up to $570. Um, then there's the uh, Tessa Morlin or abdominal fat study that I like to refer to as. And uh, the Tessa Morlin or grifta is already FDA approved, but what we're looking at is um, a potential second use. And that is that uh, there seems to be um, uh, some information out there that indicates that folks who have a large abdomen may also be having memory and concentration, memory and concentration problems. So we want to see if an individual takes Tessa Morlin for six months or 24 weeks uh, can uh, potentially uh, uh, improve their memory and concentration during this time. We do want folks to be available for a full year because folks are randomized either to start immediately in the first 20 weeks or start at, in the delay group the second 24 weeks. Uh, there's five study visits. Uh, there are phone surveys. Uh, so we want you to be able to uh, answer text messages. And if you uh, decide to participate in a um, CSF, which is cerebral spinal fluid biomarker substudy, then you can earn up to $635 uh, with these optional lumbar punctures. And if you decide not to be in the um, sub-study, the biomarker study, then it's closer to uh, uh, 550 or less, okay? Somebody uh, is uh, in the chat room, okay. All righty, so, um, the next study that I want to review is the um, OLA study or um, Healthy Older Latinos. And we're looking for folks who are English and Spanish speaking uh, with a variety of educational backgrounds. So they can actually be illiterate all the way to you know, PhDs, um, MDs. And we're looking for folks right now who are HIV positive. The study is winding down. So we're trying to fill our uh, HIV positive cohort. And the initial screen is approximately an hour and there are three visits in three years and uh, compensation can be up to $305 depending upon what you complete in the study. And um, then there's the diet and physical activity study. And this is our most popular study because just about anybody can participate in this study. We're looking for folks who are 18 years and older who want to increase their moderate physical activity. So we're looking for semi-couch potatoes uh, the study is one year. Your active participation is six months. Uh, we ask you um, if you would uh, participate in text messaging, um, use a Fitbit and a accelerometer. And a accelerometer, uh, accelerometer helps to measure 
the um, type of activity, activity you're doing, whether it's quiet, slow activity, or whether it's brusque activity. And so we can, we don't like track you like a GPS. We track you in terms of if you're moving quickly or moving slowly, and if you have a restful sleep or if you have um, a uh, agitated sleep. And then folks are uh, randomized into three groups. One of the groups uh, includes uh, walnuts, olive oil, and a Mediterranean diet. And your compensation can be up to um, uh, $465 for participating in that uh, study. So um, the other thing is, is that we are looking for smokers. Folks, they can be living with HIV or not. They can be HIV negative. As long as they're a smoker, we're looking for, we have already filled our co uh, cohort, our group of uh, non-smokers. So now we're looking for smokers. And you can smoke uh, tobacco. Um, and then um, this is to study for you because we're looking for you. There is a MRI and or PET scan. So you must be willing to do the MRI and or PET scan. And um, it's a initial uh, screening eligibility visit of one hour and then you're compensated. Um, and you can earn up to $177 for completing that MRI and our PET scan. Then there's, this is a real fun one for folks who are 60 and older. It's our virtual reality assessment. And so we wanna see how um, people who participate in a virtual reality assessment using these goggles, how their HIV can affect their uh, cognitive and balance um, issues. So it's a two and a half year study. We see you once every six months. You get eight visits over a two year period. Uh, there's five visits where we see you um, um, related to the uh, uh, HIV neurobehavior research uh, program visits and the other three visits are done at SDSU for audiology or hearing tests and you you're compensated up to $390 depending on how what you um, complete in the study and a lot of people really enjoy this. One quick uh, question so, about the last study um, mm -hmm. how much longer would that be enrolling do you know? Uh, well actually uh, we're starting to um, uh, we're starting to uh, reach the end of the study. Okay. So we've been doing really well with um, our recruitment and we just have a few more folks that we want to enroll, you know, um, but we, uh, I, we don't want folks to hesitate. Uh, if a particular study isn't available, what we'll try to do is we try to get you into any particular study. And also I want you to be aware that uh, we get new studies every six to eight months. So if you're not eligible for a current study, we'll look and see if you're eligible for a future study. And so we ask you if you're interested in doing something like that. So we keep you um, your um, information handy so that we can call you and let you know. But yes, we are almost finished with this virtual reality uh, study. And so how do you find out if you qualify? How is that done? Again, there's an initial brief phone screen, then um, the information is reviewed with the doctor or the study um, coordinator, the information that's collected over the phone. And if you appear to be a good candidate, we'll ask you to come in and schedule a full confidential eligibility visit. And some of this is done over the phone and some of it is done virtually via the internet and some of it is done in person. So what does a full confidential eligibility visit include? It's a review of the details of the study with you. We go over the consent forms, the HIPAA consent forms, the authorization to obtain and release information. Uh, so we discuss and sign those uh, consent forms together. We complete questionnaires specific to the study and we answer any of your questions. And if, it, and if you feel like um, you wanna participate in the study, then we continue. If you say, hey, this isn't for me, then that's, that's fine. There um, is no obligation to participate. So um, once we collect all the information from the screening eligibility visits and all the documents, they're reviewed with either the doctor or the study coordinator. And then they're the ones who determine the, the uh, study eligibility uh, based on the profile. And if eligible, then we schedule your first comprehensive visit for the study. So that's it, okay? And um, we just want you to be aware of that we're very sensitive to the uh, uh, pandemic and uh, we adhere to guidelines of the university, local and state guidelines too. And uh, we have the utmost um, safety uh, on our minds for participants and staff. And so our guidelines are, are constantly evaluated and subject to change depending upon 
um, what are the university and local and state guidelines. So that's why um, if somebody is doesn't feel comfortable in uh, coming in personally, then we make sure that we do as much of the visit as we can over the phone or video conference or through the internet. Or we may postpone your participation to a later date. Also, some uh, visits could be in person, like the laboratory visits. And if you want to come in, great. And if not, then we may postpone it to a, to a later date. And uh, all of our protocols include uh, at UCSD include that all employees and participants are screened for COVID systems before they enter our research um, center and that um, we only have a limited number of research staff and participants on site at any particular time. When you come to the site, uh, we ask you to bring your, a mask. Uh, study staff wears masks and clinicians wear masks and everything is clean and sanitized and disinfected prior to use and after use, after use and in between uses as much as possible. And um, so we uh, are constantly evaluating and details are subject to change. Um, we hope that you are interested in participating and learning more about our research. If you just have general questions, you're welcome to call our basic um, contact phone number. And that is the 619-543-5000 number. That's a basic number, 619-543-5000. And uh, you're also welcome to call us directly. Um, Robert Bryan, myself, and Crosby Vargas. Um, our um, phone numbers are confidential and private. We are the only ones that um, take uh, messages off the phone. So you can leave as long and as confidential a phone message as you like. And uh, any questions? Terrific. Thank you, Susanna. That was wonderful. And I did, as you were talking, put some of the um, links to the various uh, uh, websites. You know, we have uh, all your studies listed on our website for HARP. And I put up your website, uh, the 5050 number for you. And also um, the um, link to Palm Tree Clinical and their phone number for the Tessa Moreland study that uh, you guys are doing. Yes, thank you for mentioning that because um, it is, uh, we do have other sites. So um, Palm Tree Clinical is doing uh, Tessa Moreland, uh, UC San Francisco is doing the Tessa Moreland and UC uh, University of Southern California uh, is doing the Tessa Moreland study. So that is a multi-site study very similar to the what the California Neural Tissue Aid study um, used to be like. And we still have various sites located uh, throughout. Uh, one, uh, one study that I didn't mention is the last gift study. And that has to do with folks who are uh, towards the end of life. They could have an end stage um, um, organ condition or have cancer and maybe have you know one to three years of life left potentially um, be in hospice, but we like to see them before they, they uh, start hospice care. And that is a total body donation for research purposes. And that's a very important study. Um, we are doing uh, that. Um, uh, I'm, I participate in part of that as well as uh, I work with the AVRC, Dr. C uh, Sarah Gianella and Dr. David Smith. So we, we all work together. We're in one big building, so we're kind of cousins. <laughs> and uh, we work together on uh, multiple studies and our um, scientists and our um, uh, physicians and our um, uh, study coordinators and, and uh, uh, they work on multiple studies. So um, we're uh, pretty aware of what uh, the, other, um, the other hand is doing, kind of so to speak. And um, so uh, we welcome you. Uh, for folks who are living in um, uh, Palm Springs, uh, we welcome you to come and uh, to call up and see if you're potentially interested in one of our studies. And then we can discuss the details and uh, answer any questions or any concerns you may have. Um, oftentimes, um, it's a pretty straightforward uh, process and we pretty much say the same thing to every participant because we have a script that we must follow. That's our protocol. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah, please. Sure, Tim. Um, I was a participant, maybe you guys participated, it was out of Stanford. It was um, about 20 years ago, uh, alcohol 
and HIV on the brain, and they did multiple MRIs, and it sounds like the same thing that you guys do. Uh, I had balanced tests, I had cognitive tests. Were you guys a part of such a study out of Stanford? Not out of Stanford. However, we actually had our own HIV and alcohol study here. Uh, and that was a few years ago. The principal investigator um, is no longer here with us. He was doing a postdoctoral fellowship here with us. And that's the other thing we do is that you don't, you don't, uh, it's difficult. To, uh, we are so um, busy here. We um, have uh, pre and postdoctoral students with us. We uh, have uh, undergraduate students that work with us so that we can teach them more about um, uh, neurology and neuropsychiatry, get them, to get them interested into that field. Um, we have folks that have um, international fellowships and we do a lot of research where we try to, we bring folks from um, different countries to uh, our facility to learn what it is we do here so they can go back home, whether it's to Russia or to Nigeria or to Brazil or wherever and uh, start their own um, HIV Neurobehavioral Research Center. Um, so that is like very, very important. Uh, and also we have folks here like uh, Dr. Rayanne Moore is working with folks in Emory. And like I mentioned, uh, that's her um, the virtual reality study. So um, they are recruiting uh, certain um, individuals over there at in Emory, and we're recruiting certain individuals over here. Like there's more uh, Latinos and 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 people of uh, that are Caucasians over here, and at Emory they're recruiting African Americans for the study. So we go where the participants are, and our. Um, our, uh, our doctors work with a variety of people and train folks all over the United States and oftentimes internationally too. Yeah, I mean, just to piggyback on that, um, I moved to San Diego 32 years ago, in part because they had this amazing research facility there with UCSD with the Antiviral Research Center for treatment medication at the time, which is how a lot of us you know, kept ourselves alive was by volunteering to be guinea pigs in these studies so we could access to the drugs that weren't yet approved. And um, HNRP was up and running then. They had a slightly different name. I think it was the HIV Neurobehavioral Research Center. So it's a different acronym. But yeah, they started their charter study over 30 years ago and I've been in that study that long. So they've made huge contributions to the field and much of what we know about HIV in the brain is, is thanks to them and their researchers. So we owe them a big uh, debt of gratitude for all the work they've done over the course of the pandemic. Other questions for Susanna? If not, thanks, Susanna. It's always great to have you. And uh, she did put her uh, her phone personal phone number in there, and uh, we have the links to the website and the other uh, main phone numbers. So uh, please reach out. I know a lot of people from San Diego do that, and they, especially in the summertime, they love the opportunity to go to San Diego for a day and uh, <laughs> get poked and prodded, and then go to the beach. So uh, it's, it's a great resource that we have here in the region. So thank you for that. So um, I guess before we end, I just wanted to bring people up to date on what we're going to be doing starting in January. I think I mentioned it in the email that we sent out, but um, the our home at the Sinatra Auditorium that we've been uh, where we've been having programs for the last 17 years now. I had to count. Hard to believe it's been that long since we started Positive Life. But um, they, you know, as a hospital, COVID treating hospital, they're still not open to outside events and don't know when they will be. And there are also some you know, questions about parking availability when they are. So we um, have partnered with the Palm Springs Cultural Center. Uh, most of us know as the Camelot Theater, but they are now a nonprofit organization and they have very graciously agreed to host us going forward. So we'll be able to use their facility, one of the big auditoriums. Um, as you know, they have their cafe there and they will be providing meals. Um, you know, during COVID, it's gonna be a boxed meal that you can take into the theater um, and our first program is going to be a screening of the National Geographic documentary on Anthony Fauci called Fauci. Um, it's out on Disney Plus now, so if you have that, you may have seen it. Um, but this is going to be a private screening. And our programs, um, going forward, the plan is to do them both virtually and in person. As I know some people are uncomfortable going back or they may have low T cells or other health conditions. Um, and we also, since we started um, doing Zoom programs during COVID, 
we have a lot of people from outside the region who've been joining us, some from all over the country. So we want to make sure that uh, you know, we can expand our reach to them as well. So this particular program will be a screening. Um, so you can watch it in person on the big screen at the Camelot, or um, you have the option of doing it for the comfort of your own home on your device, and we'll send you a screening link. And then afterwards, we will um, uh, have a short Q&A. Uh, it's, it's a long movie, so there won't be a lot of time for discussion. But I think you'll find it really fascinating. It's, it really covers Dr. Fauci's career, kind of bookended by the two pandemics of HIV and, um, and COVID and kind of what he learned from the COVID, uh, COVID, HIV pandemic and how he supplied that to COVID you know, and made such a huge difference. So I hope you'll be able to join us for that. One thing we will be doing for, for this program and probably going forward, um, especially for this one, because you need a screener link if you're not gonna be there in person, is to ask people to RSVP on Eventbrite. And I know we've just kind of had people show up in the past and it's always worked out, but for this, because of the boxed meals, and especially for the first program, because of the screener link, we're gonna ask people to sign up um, via Eventbrite. You can still show up if you're you know, unsure and at the last minute you decide, yeah, I wanna go, uh, that's great, but there's no guarantee that we'll have a meal. You might be able to order one, but um, you know, it's a lot of people if we have uh, you know, 30, 40, 50, maybe more people showing up to uh, have the meals ready. So, you know, reserve that early. And uh, we look forward to seeing everyone next month in person for a change. Uh, fingers crossed that uh, the Omicron variant uh, continues not to be too, uh, too deadly. And uh, we'll get to keep uh, doing things out in the real world and uh, start seeing each other once again. So any questions or comments about that before we, uh, before we adjourn for the evening? Hi, Jeff, it's Gary. Thanks okay. for making all these arrangements. They seem to be better and better every time. Uh, so it presumably will, will still be the first Tuesday at six o'clock. Yeah. At, at, uh, good. Not gonna change. And I'm be consistent. I know every time we've ever had to change a, a program date for, sometimes we would do it for elections, which also fall on the first Tuesdays. We'd always have somebody show up and wonder what was going on. So uh, mm -hmm. I know as I get older, I'm more and more a creature of habit. So we try to keep it as consistent as possible. Uh, I'm looking forward to the film on Fauci and just uh, feel it's despicable that some people are calling for his uh, neck or whatever. I think he has to walk around now with security, uh, <laughs> which is just absurd. Um, but oh well, I guess uh, it's a diverse nation, too diverse for uh, some of us, more diversity necessary for others. <laughs> Anyhow, I uh, admire that man greatly. I think he's done more than anybody to bring, you know, infection information to the common uh common person mm -hmm. in, in in at least in this country and maybe in the world yeah and he truly is a hero and uh, they really the, the film does a good job of you know, pointing out all the, all the contributions he's made mm -hmm. okay. and now he can actually speak what he really wants to say and that uh, <laughs> i'm not going like oh, this during press conferences yeah <laughs> 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 Anybody else have anything to share? If not, thanks all for joining. It was great to see everyone. And I look forward to seeing your bright and shiny faces in person next month. And enjoy the holidays, everyone. Yeah, we get to get your evening back, at least part of it. <laughs> Thank you all. Bye. 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 Bye.